Um, my name is Larry A. Shaver. And Larry your Alexander. birthplace? I was born in Fairmont, West Virginia. And what date? Uh, September the 24th, 1947. Hi. My name is Jay Vermette for the Plainfield Television Group in conjunction with the Plainfield Public Library. We are conducting an interview today for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress. I'm happy to be here today with Larry Shaver. And Larry, for the record, would you please state your name? Um, my name is Larry A. Shaver. And Larry your Alexander. birthplace? I was born in Fairmont, West Virginia. And what date? Uh, September the 24th, 1947. Larry. <coughs> Let's go back to, uh, again, your birthplace and uh, where you were born. Um, and uh, Tell me about your, your life growing up. What did your parents do? Well, my, uh, my father's family were all railroaders. Or my step, I should say my stepfather. Uh, my stepfather raised me from the time I was 15 months old. Uh, his family was all railroaders and uh, they, uh, he was a telegraph operator. His father was a telegraph operator. Um, his brothers, uh, one of his two brothers were telegraph operators. Uh, a lot of his brother-in-laws were. A lot of, other, of his other family members were railroaders. They were big into railroad. My how mother. You, how about your mother? What did she well, do? Well, my mother, my mother was, uh, uh, she, did, uh, she did secretarial work and so on mm -hmm. in her, after graduating high school. and. Uh, the rest of the time she was pretty much a stay-at-home mother or did odd, odd kind of work, uh, attended bar a little bit. I come from a very poor family in a very poor area and uh, there wasn't a whole lot of work to do in that part of the country at that time. Uh, the biggest industries were the railroad, of course, and mining. And uh, where was this? Uh, the, I was from northern West Virginia. Okay. Brothers and sisters? I have several half-brothers and sisters. Uh, I have no brothers that, or sisters that are whole brothers and sisters. Um, any of them serve in the military? Yes. Uh, I have an older uh, half-brother that uh, served, uh, I believe he served uh, six years in, uh, uh, in the United States Army and he was in Vietnam as well. Uh, also I have a younger brother, uh, half-brother. Both of these brothers and I share the same mother. Uh, that uh, uh, served, uh, I believe, 27 years in the Army okay. and was a, was a career soldier. Okay. You yourself, you served in the uh, Marine Corps in yes. Vietnam. Now, w were you drafted? Or no, sir. I, uh, you enlisted? I, yeah, I quit high school and, uh, and enlisted in the, in the Marine Corps in uh, 1964. And why did you choose the Marine Corps? Well, uh, growing up, I had always had a... Uh, uh, great respect for my country and for the military and I wanted to be the best and that in those days that's that was considered the best and uh, so you enlist in the uh, Marine Corps in West Virginia mm -hmm. and you are sent to basic training at uh, Camp Lejeune well I was actually sent to basic training at Paris Island South Carolina okay so uh, had you been out of uh, your native West Virginia before? Oh yes, yes. I had been here to Chicago uh, on, on a couple of occasions. Actually lived here uh, uh, in, on three different occasions. Um, 1963 I was up here and stayed with uh, a stepbrother of mine and uh, uh, prior to during the summer and then uh, my family had moved up here when work got bad uh, in 1956 and they were up here for about a year at that time and uh, then again in 1959. So I had been in the Chicago area, but other than that, that was pretty much the only place I'd ever been. Okay, let's talk about Paris Island. What was basic like? Well, Paris Island was still, in those days, uh, uh, in the early 60s, it was kind of uh, the old school. They had just, they just did some, some changes in the Marine Corps at the time uh, from the old World War II era, Korea era uh, training. Uh, they had some real bad situations down there. I believe it had only been a year or two before that, uh, before my arrival, that uh, I believe they had uh, 12 Marines killed 
uh, on a training mission. During training? During training. Uh, you're probably familiar with that, mm -hmm. where they followed a DI drill instructor into the swamps and were drowned. Right. Uh, because that, that was the way things wor worked at that time. So they had uh, kind of uh, uh, changed a little bit. They had changed uniforms. They had reverted a rank. Uh, you know, they reverted the ranks in the Marine Corps down one to match the Army's ranks because they had no rank to match the Army's ranks in one, one enlisted grade. Talk about the training a little bit in basic training. What do you think was more difficult, the physical aspect or the mental aspect? Uh, probably for me, the, the, the physical and the mental were probably pretty much equal. Uh, like I say, going back to my childhood, I grew up in a, in a, ver, a, a very uh, volatile in, environment. Uh, it was uh, uh, hostile at times, so it was one of those things where I was used to uh, mental. I, I was really, for the most part, on my own from the time I was about nine or ten years old. So uh, I, I grew, grew up and was a little more mature than most 17-year-old guys are. But uh, the, the, the training was very r r rigorous because uh, f I was small. Number one, I was uh, actually, at the time, uh, too small to be in the Marine Corps. I was only five foot four and weighed 110 pounds when I entered boot camp, which was unheard of for a Marine. I mean, I was a, I was a, I was a little guy. Uh, and because of that, it was a little harder on me. I was, it, was, it was the same as being the, the, uh, the heavy set person, you know, that right. they ride really hard right. because he's heavy. Well, they rode me because I was You're small. You're on the op opposite end of the spectrum. Absolutely. Um, let's talk about uh, at that time in the early 60s, segregation is still kind of going on. Yes. Very much in the South. How about within your unit, within no. your base? Absolutely none. Uh, if you were if you were in training, uh, collar wasn't collar ethnic uh, ethnic background, uh, creed n uh, nothing none of that stuff mattered at all. You were you were in training. You relied on your training partner. This is what you were taught. The Marine Corps basically, uh, the first thing the Marine Corps does is what people have to understand is the reason their training is so much different from other branches of the service is because they focus on teamwork. And in order to focus on teamwork, you have to have a mental attitude that will allow you to give of yourself as well as take, uh, which is the working together thing, the teamwork aspect. So in order to get to, to arrive at this in Marine Corps training, they have to change your mental attitude. Some people would actually call it brainwashing. Uh, get you down to a level that they can bring you back up and build you the way they want to. So <clears throat> even in the mess hall, you go to chow, you guys are, everybody's sitting together? Everybody's equal. Yeah. How was the chow, by the way? Very good. I thought it was good because I, again, <laughs> my chow wasn't the best in the world growing up, so the chow for me was, uh, I'm, I'm a bread and gravy guy, you know? So you got, so. Three, you got three squares every day. Uh, and, I, and I enjoyed it, believe me. Um, so you finished Paris Island. You obviously finished basic training. Mm -hmm. Then you go to your advanced training mm -hmm. at Camp, uh, Camp Geiger, uh, North Carolina, Camp Lejeune. And uh, what did uh, what was your training like there? Uh, it was totally different because in 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 again in boot camp you're you're basically they're working on the the mental aspect as, and and the physical building your body up. When you get to advanced infantry training, they're actually teaching you how to use weapons. Uh, how to maneuver and, in other words, the basic traits of war. Which uh, rifles were you training with, M16s? M we were training, M no, we trained, we trained with M1s. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, in boot camp, we trained with, them, with M14s okay. uh, and M1s. But mostly, uh, when we went to Camp, uh, uh, to camp Geiger uh, for inf advanced infantry training, we were training with M14s at that time, because that was the weapon we were using. And the, it, let's talk a little bit about the tactical training, uh, the, you know, the small units training. Mm -hmm. um, how does that work? Well, uh, you have to not only be able to work as a large group and follow general orders, but you also have to be an individualist as well, because there are, you know, it's broken down all the way into four-man squads. So you have to be able to work with a small group 
uh, be able to give orders, be able to take orders, be able to follow orders from the top and get the job done. And sometimes when you're cut off from your units or whatever, you're the only one or your, your group is the only ones that have anything to follow. So they have to be uh, trained in such a way that they can be individualist as well, uh, whether it be one person, two people, five people, or 20. Do you, did you recognize amongst your fellow uh, Marines, hey, this guy's a leader, I can trust his judgment? Oh, yes. Yeah, you learn that early on in, uh, in boot camp, actually. Uh, the, the DIs are very good at that. The drill instructors, uh, they're, they're highly trained. Uh, my senior DI was a, a career, he was actually a World War II veteran, uh, uh, winding down toward the end of his career. Uh, I think he had 16, 17, 18 years in at the time. Uh, 19, maybe 20, somewhere around there, but he was an right of end of World War II veteran. Uh, uh, J.D. Perkins was, uh, he was, he was a black man, but he was very, he was a guy that everybody looked up to. Uh, everybody understood that he was the guy that was, that was going to save your life someday. And uh, so you, you, you kind of learn from him and then you put that into perspective. Um, how long did this training last? Uh, I, I was in the original training before Vietnam got out, so uh, basic training was 12 weeks and ITR or advanced infantry training was four weeks, so it was 16 total. <coughs> and so then after that, um, you get your orders. You're going to be deployed somewhere. Mm -hmm. and well, I get 10 days, 10 days leave. I go home and then uh, I get my orders. Uh, my orders actually comes to my home. It doesn't, we don't get the orders before we actually left boot camp. We got our orders when we went home. And when I received my orders like two days after I got home, I, uh, in the mail, I believe they were, uh, that my first duty station was to report back to uh, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina for deployment to Okinawa, Japan. And what, were you, what was your thoughts then? Wow, I'm going overseas right off the bat. And you know, that's what a lot of Marines wanted. They wanted to get out of country, to get into a foreign country somewhere where they could see something see, or do something. Yes. You know, we were young guys. Yeah. So you were fairly excited. Well, I was. Uh, my stepfather wasn't. Uh, he wasn't excited when I went to service. He. Uh, Why? Well, he he was. Uh, uh, he never was in the service because of well, during World War II he was a telegraph operator, and of course they were highly needed, and so he didn't go. His uh, both of his brothers did, but he didn't go. Uh, and uh, he was totally against war. Uh, he didn't feel there was a need for. Uh, us to get into a war that we weren't attacked. Uh, he thought that we had no business going to a foreign country. And he thought that, uh, I believe his last words as, uh, as I walked out the door to go to, to uh, meet my recruiter to go to boot camp was, uh, 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 that, that damn Kennedy's going to get us in a war over there and you're going to be right in the middle of it. I don't want anything to do with it. Kind of tough for a 17-year-old to kind of fathom all that information, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, 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 I need to rephrase that just a little bit because that's not correct. He said, John Kennedy has got us into a damn war over there, and Lyndon Johnson is going to get us in whole hog. Well, and he was right. Well, I was going <laughs> to say, <coughs> history will bear that history out. History will bear that out. So uh, you go back to Camp Lejeune. Mm -hmm. You get on a troop transport to go to Okinawa? Uh, I got into a tr troop transport, yes. And this is a Navy vessel? No, actually, yeah, it was a Navy vessel, but it was an co old commandeered uh, ship that actually, uh, during peacetime uh, earlier, they had actually used for, I believe, a cruise ship at one time. Uh, it was the, the USS Salton, and I've researched the history on the Salton, and it was named after a general, and it went all the way back into service in World War II. Uh, How many Marines were on this ship? Uh, 2,000. 2,000 of you. Mm -hmm. There was a full battalion. What was the uh, conditions like uh, uh, over? Yeah, how long did it take to, to get to Okinawa? Uh, 18 days. Okay. 18 or, it was either 18 or 19 days. And what was that trip like? Uh, well, <laughs> for me it, was, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't the most pleasant trip for, for a couple of us. We, uh, the first three days was, was really bad because we had gotten, uh, myself personally, had gotten sunburnt real bad on the beach in California uh, and uh, had to suffer with that because in them days you couldn't go to sick bay with a sunburn. Uh, 
right. because that was uh, destroying government property and you could actually be written up for it. So we, you kind of grit and bear it. And on board ship, that wasn't easy. <laughs> what was the chow like on, on the ship? Uh, pretty much the same. Actually, actually it was very good. Yeah. Very good. Wasn't as good, I don't think, as it was in boot camp, but it was very good. And it, you talked earlier, a lot of guys joined the service because they want to go overseas. How about some guys that joined the service not knowing they were going to go overseas? What was their reaction to this? Well, I think in the Marine Corps, uh, well, some, some as, as you know, back in those days, uh, there were several ways to get into the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, it was, uh, some people were actually drafted in. Some mm -hmm. people were forced to go to the service in general, and they would pick the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, one way uh, that the courts used in those days, especially in the large cities like L.A., Chicago, New York, was to uh, actually, uh, if, if they didn't have a, uh, if they had a violent background but they didn't, hadn't done anything really, really bad, uh, but they were a, a career criminal, for example, and they were just a, a menace to society, the judge would give them an option, you know, it, it, we either put you in jail or we send you into the service. You go into the service or you go to jail. So a lot of them would pick the service. And when they do that, uh, a lot of them would, would enlist in the Marine Corps. So we had those kind of people. So you get to Okinawa. What were your duties there? What was life like there? Uh, it was mostly all training. Uh, I had to do, we had to do uh, jungle training because uh, when I got there, uh, they had already deployed uh, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines to, uh, to Vietnam because they had had an uprising in uh, the Da Nang area. We had a large Air Force base at Da Nang and uh, they had already uh, had hostility there from uh, the Viet Cong and uh, they suspected North Vietnamese regulars were in the area and were supporting them. So they had sent a battalion of Marines in already to protect the air base. And you're aware of this while you're in Okinawa? You're yes, we're aware of it, but uh, not 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 really uh, thinking too much about it. You know, we're thinking, well, you know, this is just another uprising that they're going to put down, and then they'll be back. But we learned uh, early on that that wasn't the case; that these guys weren't coming back. Did you ha ever have a thought in your mind that, hey, maybe Vietnam's my next? Oh yeah, stop? we know it. We know it from from the time we started jungle training. We knew it. Let's talk about the jungle training. Okay. Tell give us a typical day in, in jungle training. Well, uh, first of all, you, 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 they, you, you're oriented to the, the type of terrain uh, that because most of us were from the continental United States, we had never seen jungle. We don't have jungle per se in this country uh, unless you go in real tropical areas down, down south where uh, we still don't really have jungles like they right. do in Southeast Asia. So we were trained more or less how to maneuver around through jungles, what to look for, uh, what to look for in booby traps, uh, different ways that things like that could be done, and also uh, uh, how to survive out there, how to survive if you were cut off from, your, from the enemy uh, or from your troops and you were in en enemy territory and you had to survive uh, with nothing to eat and uh, the environment and the natives were all hostile. Uh, you couldn't trust anybody, so all of this is, is bright in how, what you can eat, what you can't eat, uh, you know, and you learn to eat a lot of things <laughs> and, <laughs> to survive. And give us an example of some of the more exotic things that... Uh, well, roaches, you know, uh, uh, worms, uh, different kinds of, there's different kinds of, as we know in this country, there's different kinds of crawling things in the ground. Some of them you can eat, some of them you can't because they, they have venom in them. Uh, so you're kind of taught, you know, the difference between what this looks like, what that looks like, and what you can eat. And you say, well, you know, when you're not hungry, you say, well, I can't eat that. You know, I'm not going to eat that. But after you're out in there two or three days without anything to eat, you know, everything starts looking pretty good. Right. <laughs> Speaking of venom, um, what about the snakes and the... Oh, yeah. You're learned, you, you were taught, taught to deal with them, and, and that, that training really came in handy because in the jungles of Southeast Asia, as you know, there are, there are quite a few poisonous snakes. Uh, we had occasions to come up on, uh, uh, well, cobras. Uh, there's several other different kinds of poisonous snakes that are that are very deadly. That uh, you come into, especially if you're doing groundwork, you know, or something like that. Uh, and, and just being in the jungle, you're exposed to them, so you have to know where they're most likely to be, uh, how to how to how to get in an area because. 
you know, normally uh, what we do in this country is you make noise like loggers and so on to, to move out rattlesnakes or copperheads or whatever might be dangerous, is make noise. Well, you can't do that in the jungle when you're in war. The, that, that can get you killed. Right, right. <laughs> and now, <coughs> when you're in Okinawa, one of your, uh, part of your training is you trained to be a tunnel rat, mm -hmm. correct? Mm-hmm. First of all, and I'm guessing because of your size, you were probably singled out. Yep. But secondly, what, what motivated you to do that? Uh, orders. That's what they <laughs> wanted me to do. And uh, I, I have to admit, I didn't, uh, I didn't particularly like the idea too much. Uh, I was trained with, a, with an M14 rifle, and when they handed me a 45 caliber, of course we were trained with that too, but right. I mean that wasn't my weapon of, of choice, but when they hand you a, a shoulder holster and an M45 uh, caliber uh, handgun and say, well, you're not going to be able to carry your rifle here, you're going to have to leave your rifle behind, you know, it kind of separates you. So you basically, you have your 45 and your flashlight. And 45, your, well, you have your 45 and your, your, your bayonet and uh, your fighting knife and a couple other little trinkets that you can carry along with you. And, uh, and you're training for this in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to ask this question again. Do you think you're ever going to use that um, knowledge in Vietnam? Uh, yeah, we do because uh, we're, we're pretty much taught that, trained that there. They're saying, you know, we're, we're oriented to as the, the type of enemy. And we studied that in the classroom as well. I mean, all the jungle work, jungle training is like any other training. It's not all about the physical part of it, but you have to go to the classroom and learn about it as well. And history teaches us a great lesson. Uh, as you know, the, the South Vietnamese and uh, the had, had driven the French out. Right. Was it, did you have French uh, um, instructors no. there? No. No. All of our instructors were Marine Corps. Um, <clears throat> aside from training in Okinawa, um, what was it like being there? It's a beautiful island. Oh, it's, it? it's, it's, it's a wonderful island. Uh, I got to see all of it. Uh, on my days off, uh, I traveled around the island. I seen the Naha port. Uh, you know, the southern part of the island. Beautiful people, great people. Uh, and how did they generally treat the, the uh, good. Marines Very and good. soldiers? Very good. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, how long were you in Okinawa? We actually was there from uh, March into June, so it would have been about three months. Three months? Yes. And so then you get your orders? Uh, well, we didn't get orders. Uh, we, we, well, the, the, that, yeah, that's. Our, our, uh, our battalion got orders, yes. And to go to Vietnam? Well, we got orders, but we didn't know where we were going. Uh, we kind of assumed that's where we were going because they didn't tell us much. Uh, they put us on a beach, uh, gave us combat gear, issued all of our combat gear to us, put us on the beach, uh, put us on uh, uh, White Beach, and, and we were there. Uh, unfortunately, we had a problem. Uh, there was a typhoon at that time, and I cannot for the life of me remember the name of the typhoon, but there was a typhoon in the South China Sea, and uh, it was really wrecking havoc, wreaking havoc with the uh, uh, shipping lanes. And so our, our, our ships couldn't come into shore close enough to get us. To pick you up. Right. So we had to sit there and wait and wait and wait and wait, and we waited two weeks on the beach before we were, they were ready to, at that time, they, things were getting really heated up. And that's when we actually learned where we were going. Because they told us that they needed us to support our 1st Battalion, and we knew where they were. And, uh, in Da Nang. In, they were in the Da Nang area, i Corps area of Vietnam, the northern part, part just south of North Vietnam. And uh, we, knew we, we knew where we were going, and they were going to fly us there because they needed us. And then all of a sudden, the next day, the weather broke, and they loaded us on troop ships. And how long uh, a journey was the uh, from Okinawa to Vietnam on the troop ship? It was about a day and a half, yeah. two days. Might have been three. What was your first impression when you got off the troop ship and you walked into uh, the country of Vietnam? Well, we didn't walk, we didn't get off the ship and walk into the country. We may actually made a beach beachhead. Okay. We made a beachhead. We was probably one of the last beachheads, if not the last beachhead, that the Marine Corps. Uh, probably has ever made in combat. No, I don't think was after it, that they made anymore. Was it under fire? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what were your thoughts then? Uh, scared. 
as most people are. Uh, uh, your, your training takes over really quick. I mean, it's your, your mental attitude takes over. It's either, you know, you, you focus on what you've been trained and it's going through your head all the time. You know, this is how I stay alive. This is how I stay alive. And after that first skirmish, after it's over with, what were your thoughts then? Hey, I made it through this one. Now I got to go to work. Yeah. No, now I got to go to work because now I've got to go back. I've got to go back on the landing craft, go back out to the ships, go to a different ship, and get our. We had to get our equipment. See, so being in being in motor transport as I was, my my MOS actually was 35, uh, 35, 31, which was truck driver. Uh, and so once we did our our, of course, in the Marine Corps, every everybody is an infantryman right so when you make the beachhead everybody makes the beachhead when you fight everybody fights but when the fighting is done and you have to get those troops off the beach and get them to an area where where they're secured then yeah. then our job takes over and they go rest and we get back on landing craft go to the LSDs at that time now they use uh, different different vehicles now but uh, at that time, we'd get back on the, the landing craft, go to the LSTs, secure our trucks, put them on the landing craft, and take them there. And that, that took us the rest of the day till dark. So I was going to say, from the time you landed on the beach until the time you got all your equipment back there, how long? That was uh, 24 hours, 36 hours? No, I think we, we, actually, we actually went down the wet nets into the landing craft about 4.30 in the morning. Uh, we actually circled the ships for a good two hours until they got everything together and they was ready to make the beachhead uh, and everything was, was, all the intelligence was in and everything. Uh, and then so we probably secured that area about an hour and a half after we landed we had the area secured so it was probably around nine in the morning and then we went back there and about nine, so it was about 12 hours after that that we made the beaches again about nine o'clock at night with our and loading troops. And then our day just, then our day's still going because now we got to get the troops somewhere. Um, so while you're there, uh, while you uh, uh, had landed and, and, and got there, was the, uh, you were there to support the Air Force base, correct? We were there to, we were there to support the Air Force How base. How happy yeah. were those guys to see you? We never seen them. Uh, we never seen them. We never seen the, uh, the only thing we saw was the out, outside area of the, of the base because we went right, right to, to relieve troops that had been there now for three months. Guarding the perimeter. Guarding the perimeter and they had set up uh, uh, outposts around the area so what we did basically was we went in and took over right then and like I say we got into that area around uh, around midnight by the time we got into that area it was somewhere around between 11 and 1 a.m. and uh, at that time we had to, still had to go to work because uh, we went and relieved a lot of these guys the ones that were fit still yet fit for duty which was most of us uh, we went uh, would sleep a couple hours and then we go relieve these guys because some of these guys had been on perimeter now for three months under combat what was the uh, living conditions like in in those uh, perimeter camps uh, no no hot food uh, they still didn't have hot food they had uh, we were still living in foxholes uh, you slept ate everything was was done in the ground uh, we had no uh, we had no uh, tents or anything like that at that time. There was no hard shell, shelters or anything. Everything was done in ground. We were a little more fortunate because being, uh, when, when at, at night we lived in the foxholes. Uh, when we weren't in foxholes or running patrols, then we were a little more fortunate because we had vehicles. So we could sleep in or under our vehicles. Um, let's talk about the patrols generally at night. Always at night. We had patrols in the daytime, but those patrols were usually just general patrols. The combat patrols, uh, what, what we call search and destroy, was always at night. And <coughs> we talked about this a little bit earlier um, before the interview started. <coughs> the technology today with the night vision and everything mm -hmm. certainly didn't exist when you no. were it, it was there. The, the technology existed, but the resources and the development of it really wasn't that great at that time. This was kind of the forefront of, of today's modern military. And so a lot of things came out of the, uh, people don't realize, a lot of things came out of the, the Vietnam War uh, that they use now, that they went and used in the, the first Gulf War, uh, uh, ways of doing things, uh, even though it was two different atmospheres 
with the desert and the jungle, they still yet had uh, uh, or ordinance and things that they changed, so going to the M16, for example, uh, using different kinds of bombs. Uh, and again, the same thing with, uh, with night vision. Night vision was very important. It's very important now. Saves a lot of lives. And we only, the only ones that had it during our uh, time was forward observers, which would be usually recon that were placed during the day uh, that were put in forward positions and then they were buried or they would sneak into an area during the day and they would stay there until nightfall so they could use their infrared goggles or infrared scopes. Um, <coughs> you mentioned the M16 earlier and you had trained with the M1. Any thoughts on the differences? Never used an M16. Uh, I trained with it uh, later on but most of all when I was training troops back at, uh, at uh, Lejeune after I was in Vietnam we still used the M14 for training. We didn't use the M uh, the M16. M16s were very uh, were still yet very very hard to come by. They hadn't made a lot of them yet, and, and everything that was made was sent directly to the front. So we still use the old as as we did the M1s in boot camp to train. Uh, we use the M14s. Let's talk about some of the uh, different engagements uh, that you participated in in Vietnam. Um, um, Harvest Moon, Starlight. Yeah, those were the, those were the first. Uh, well, actually, the second and third. Uh, one, one there was one before that uh, that I participated in called Marble Mountain. Uh, anyone that was there during that era will remember that. That was a uh, the best way I can describe it is coastal area of a country uh, that comes up flat from the coast. Usually, is flat, fertile farmland back into you come to the mountainous areas. Uh, Vietnam was no different and uh, if you'll kind of picture in your mind a uh, uh, place out west where you have this flat desert uh, or flat area and then all of a sudden right in the middle of it you've got this gigantic structure which is a stone mountain or whatever. Uh, Marble Mountain was something like that. It was a, it was a, a granite mountain that uh, uh, was situated just south of, of Da Nang, between Da Nang and, and, and the coast. And uh, it was a very religious area. Uh, that, air, that mountain, because of it being in the middle of nowhere, with no other mountains around it or anything, was kind of a, uh, a shrine type thing. It was deemed special. Oh yeah, uh, the, the, uh, that had been for thousands of years. Uh, well, the inside of that mountain was uh, a massive amount of caves and structures, excuse me, was a massive amount of caves and structures that the enemy was using for uh, caches of weapons and uh, uh, food stores. They would store, they would steal food from the peasants or take their food uh, and they would store it in there for, for combat purposes and also the North Vietnamese regulars was, had been for a long time preparing for this and they had been with the help of the Viet Cong moving stores down in there of ammunition and, and firearms and putting it in there. And that was our first job was to, and it was w very he heavily guarded. Uh, even though they weren't outside, they were inside, very heavily guarded. So the first operation, uh, actually what you would call an offensive operation rather than just a defensive operation with the first battalion that was already there was for us to go in and secure that mountain. So essentially they had hollowed out the mountain for yes. their, for their All needs. All of the religious structures in there and everything had been converted over to uh, weapons caches. And successful? Uh, we were successful, yes. We took the mountain in about, uh, I want to say, probably less than a week. We uh, had secured the mountain. Was this a Marine Corps action only? Totally Marine Corps. We had no soldiers there at the okay. time, no Army soldiers there. Okay. The other engagement, Starlight? Starlight came next uh, in August. Uh, Marble Mountain was in June, July. That was the last part of June, first part of July, right after uh, we had settled in there. Uh, the next, uh, the next major operation was that later on in uh, the last part of August into the month of September and during the harvest period in this country they called it Harvest Moon uh, and that was a, an operation which fell into, uh, we moved south uh, to a place called Chulai and uh, we, this, this operation we actually worked in conjunction with the 101st Airborne. Uh, Army uh, and the Army Rangers. They moved into the uh, Aswan Valley in the 
uh, moved west in toward Cambodia, and they had been dropped in there by uh, either by uh, parachute or by helicopter and moved in because there was large regiments at that time moving down from North Vietnam. There were large regiments of North Vietnam regulars, and they wanted to cut them off before they could get through that area on toward the southern parts to the Mekong Delta and so on. Let's talk about your mindset a little bit as you go from, from the beachhead, the original beachhead, mm -hmm. through these uh, different engagements. What is your mindset? Do you, do you get more confident? Do you get... Oh, yeah. You grow up really fast. Uh, once, you, once you've been in combat a little bit, and, and uh, you, uh, it's very hardening. It's very hardening very quick. I think the, the human mind, I think most psychologists will tell you, that the human mind hardens quick to, to, uh, to devastating reality, uh, you know, where things are, are so bad that uh, you have either two choices. And, and I've seen both. I've seen, I've seen Marines actually uh, break down. That was uh, my next question. Yeah. Uh, obviously, there were some guys that uh, uh, lost it for all intents and purposes, went, uh, went over the edge. Uh, we had uh, any of your buddies? Three, yeah, three, three, uh, three of my buddies went over the edge, uh, especially after we had lost a couple of our real close friends, guys that I went through boot camp with. Uh, how many? Fr um, how many of the guys from boot camp were still with you when you got to Vietnam? Uh, there was five of us. Mm -hmm. And do you still keep in touch with any of them? They're all gone. They're all gone. Um, what was it like when you weren't, did you ever get a chance when you were deployed over there to, you know, hey, you got a couple hours off, you can go into this town or that town? Did you? Uh, we, we, yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I did. Uh, I went into Da Nang a couple of times after we had kind of secured Da Nang as best we could and it became friendly enough that, that they would let us have liberty there. Uh, I went into town once in a while. And would get what I called a steak and french fries, but I don't know what the french fries were made out of. They didn't taste like potatoes. But the steak, I'm, I'm pretty positive that we, we, we pretended that nice, thick, juicy steak was steak, but I believe it was water buffalo, because <laughs> okay. I never did see a cow in that country. <laughs> um, what were the civilians like towards, towards the Americans? Uh, I guess about the best way you could say it was uh, they were leery. Uh, you could pretty much tell, uh, and, and I meant to bring for this interview some pictures that I had of, of captured uh, prisoners that we had captured, but unfortunately I forgot them. But uh, th most of the civilians that were uh, friendly or that were actually, we were there to help, uh, were friendly to us as much as they could be, but they were very leery, not only of us, but of, their, of the Viet Cong. Because if anything happened, and the Viet Cong found out about it, they had no mercy. They were, they were like the terrorists of today. Uh, they didn't fight by, by, by the Geneva Convention. Uh, they, they fought anything and anybody they could. Um, and again, you and I talked earlier about this before we started the interview, um, the difference in warfare today in terms of terrorists and in terms of what you faced in Vietnam, where it, they would stay and fight as opposed to the suicide uh, bombers that we have nowadays. Well, we we kind of had a combination of both, because uh, they weren't they weren't uh, uh, they would use children or women as well as booby traps. Uh, one of the one of the famous things during the day, especially not at never at night, but during the day, they would use uh, children. Because what does a guy that's it's 115 degrees outside in the jungle and it's humid and you're in a rice paddy, uh, you come out in a rice paddy and all of a sudden there's a kid there with a nice cold beer, you know. <laughs> so you know you you look you look for that. I'd like for people to understand that the when I speak of of children being wired with explosives and so on, this weren't to, today they do that mostly because they want to. In those days, it was done, and women the same way. Usually, were innocent peasants that they would force to do this. Uh, 
For example, they would always use a, a child maybe six, seven years old. And this was one of the things that really hurt guys like me, young kids and people that uh, weren't used to that kind of a thing, was that they would use children and young women uh, and they would have, they, they have such a, those people have such a, a uh, respect for their parents that if a Viet Cong or came into the village and said, I'm going to take your daughter or your son, and they would, they would, they would start at that point to wrap them in explosives and use them for a, a, an explosive device. Uh, the parents, if the parents said anything, they may be five, six, seven siblings, and, and they would kill one of them just so that the rest of them would live. And the parents would, 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 would back off and do that because it, for, the, for the sake of the rest of their family. Now, when you're seeing all this too, um, especially with the children, do you think about your brothers and sisters? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You and think your about, parents? Oh, yeah. You think, about, you think about everything in your whole life. It's like your whole life runs. They say your life runs before you, before you die. But I'll tell you, it runs before you when you're in a situation like that all the time. You're always bringing things and like that back. I assume there are times where you feel just so frustrated and helpless that, that you can't really change that. There are, there are times, uh, right, there, it, it, it's very frustrating. Uh, it, it's, you, you feel helpless. Uh, you, first you, first you, you, feel, you feel fear, and then you feel anger. You feel tr tremendous anger at how people can do this to other people. Uh, how you can do it to your own people. Uh, because most of these Viet Cong were, were not North Vietnamese, they were South Vietnamese. How do you, how do you temper that anger? Uh, you, do, you do the best job you can uh, to... Within the guidelines? Within the, gui within the guidelines to follow the things. And, and you ran into the same situation with your own, with your own people. Uh, we came on patrols uh, that had been, we came on, you know, all the people they captured they didn't necessarily take back to a prison camp uh, especially early on because they didn't have prison camps uh, they would take if they if they captured somebody they would uh, well let's put it this way if you were wounded and and your your unit didn't get you out especially soldiers because the Marine Corps usually doesn't leave anybody regardless they'll, they'll stay there till the last man's out but we came upon people uh, when we were on patrols that had been wounded and they hadn't got them out uh, they had assumed they were dead until they secured the area, and we would come on people that were taken away in the night. Uh, when they take away their own, they would take away the Americans as well, and then we would find them a day or two later, and they would be maybe still alive, uh, or or maybe not, but they would be uh, mutilated, or they would be put in such a way to send a message to us that this could happen to you. Um. So after witnessing all this, being in country and being involved in these engagements, you were obviously awarded by the U.S. Uh, United States Marine Corps. Uh, uh, tell us uh, what type of awards you you uh, received. Well, I received the uh, the Vietnam uh, ca uh, the campaign, uh, the, the the Vietnam Service Medal, which everybody that that was there received. Uh, I also received uh, they they. When we went in, since we went in before June the 1st of 1965, uh, prior to June the 1st there was no Vietnam Service Medal. So since we were there before that, I, I believe it was June the, first, June the 30th. Uh, because we were there prior to June the 30th of 1965, we were eligible for the uh, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal, which was what the Vietnam Service Medal became. Uh, now, since the, we were there first, we were awarded that. And then after June 30th, we were also awarded the Vietnam Service Medal. So that's why you'll see some people wearing either or and some people wearing both. That means they were there both, both before and after Prior. that. Right. Yeah. And uh, then the, uh, after, after the war was over, uh, or, or toward the end of the war, the South Vietnamese government awarded the, the, uh, the uh, Vietnamese campaign uh, ribbon, and they also issued the uh, uh, Vietnam Vietnam uh, presidential campaign ribbon. Uh, 
They also, uh, and then of course, uh, if any Marine that's in combat receives the combat action ribbon, which I have, uh, then there's, uh, I'm trying to think of all, all the, there's, I have nine, I have nine citations, or, or nine, nine ribbons or medals. Uh, I can't remember what they all are, I keep forgetting. Talk about uh, your climb through the ranks, you were promoted several times? Uh, I was promoted uh, four times in two years. I was promoted uh, in Vietnam, I, when I went there I was a buck private, E1. I was promoted to uh, PFC meritoriously and then uh, to Lance Corporal meritoriously in the field. And uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the responsibilities as you go up through the ranks. Well, you, uh, your responsibilities change. You, uh, you know, it's it's kind of uh, it's kind of hard for most people to think of a of a, a 19 year old uh, training troops training back in the states. But uh, we had a lot of respect when we came back. Uh, the guys that came back, cause somebody because we learned things. We learned things that hadn't been taught in previous wars. This was a different kind of war for us. Uh, I'm sure as it went when we went into the desert and fought. Uh, uh, this was a different kind of war uh, because of the type of war we was fighting. Uh, the same thing then. So our knowledge when we came back was, was very valuable. So most of all of us when we came back uh, after our first tour was to go to Camp, uh, excuse me, Camp Legion, North Carolina and, uh, or Camp Pendleton, California and, and uh, teach the people that were going to be replacing the people over there. Uh, and let's talk about that a little bit. Um, <coughs> when you did come back, First and foremost, um, how did you feel when you got your order said you're going back to the United States? Oh, I was ecstatic. I, I wanted, you know, I, you know, I was ready to go home. Uh, I uh, and actually, actually left the foxhole at the perimeter because door, uh, at it, door, after after Operation uh, uh, Star uh, after Operation Starlight, Christmas '65, uh, I was transferred from my unit to. Uh, the 3rd MAF, they had started a new uh, organization in the Marine Corps called the 3rd MAF, which was 3rd Marine Amphibious Force, and it was headquartered uh, in Da Nang. And this is where they did all the intelligence. Uh, this is where they actually ran a war from at that point, uh, at least as far as the, the uh, uh, Air Force and, and the uh, uh, Navy and the Marine Corps was concerned. And uh, so I was transferred to that unit to set up uh, a motor transport unit there, and I was given an old uh, jeep. I was given an old jeep that didn't run very well. I was given a. Uh, I was given a. Uh, let's see, a, uh, two trucks. One didn't have a motor in it, and this was our motor pool. By the time I left there, <laughs> that was I think in February of '65, uh, and by the time I left there in March or April, uh, whenever I think it was April when I left, we had a massive amount of equipment, but that was what we started out with, three vehicles. And, and, and our, our commanding officer was a supply major who knew nothing about transportation. <laughs> and let me ask you that. What was the morale like uh, with your buddies in terms of the uh, officers and, uh, and the supply situation and all that? Well, was our, there a lot of joking around, a lot of grousing, a lot of... No. Uh, well, early on, uh, they ran out of officers. Uh, they ran out of uh, junior grade officers. Uh, second lieutenants was very hard to find. Uh, second lieutenants were, because they were green, most of them at that time, because they weren't turning them out of Annapolis fast enough uh, or out of Quantico, uh, they were promoting uh, not what, what we called 90 day wonders. Guys that come out of ROTC in college, they had three years and they'd, they'd make a second lieutenant out of Pinacetas bars on them and send them to Vietnam. Well, their in-country life expectancy was 20 minutes because they just didn't have the, in, the, the, they had no combat experience, they had no combat training, they had nothing. Well, very early on they learned that the best way they could survive was get there and hide. So they got there and learned how to play pinochle, found some guys that didn't want to go out in the field and play pinochle with them, <laughs> stayed, out of, stayed out of the area and everybody else did the work. Uh, but the morale uh, toward those kind of people were, was very, uh, the last thing we wanted to hear was we had a new, uh, a new squad leader coming in or, or a new uh, 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 officer coming in that was green because that could get you killed. 
So the NCOs pretty much run the show when you went into the field with those kind of people, even if they were in the field, the, uh, your senior NCOs usually ran the show. Um, coming back, so you start in Da Nang and you get transferred back to Da Nang mm -hmm. and then you come back to the United States. Mm -hmm. How did you get back? I uh, came back by plane. Actually, I flew back to Okinawa uh, and uh, then we, went, we stayed in Okinawa one night, went through customs there because all our gear had to be checked to make sure we didn't have weapons and so on or anything out of, you know, didn't have anybody's head in our, you know, in our, <laughs> in our sea bag or anything. Actually, all we, we wanted to do was get home. But uh, then we flew by plane back to California. Uh, commercial flight or military? Military. What was that like? Uh, very hard, very long. It was like 12 hour flight and it was like I believe a 707. Uh, we didn't have seats, we had nets. Uh, and we didn't have, we didn't have, all of our gear had been basically for the most part ruined. I mean we went through monsoons, we went through sleeping on the ground. You'd wake up in the morning and find that your, all your gear's gone and you'd have to go find it because it, you just get used to sleeping in water. So it doesn't bother you to have running water running down you at night. So you get up and all your gear is gone. The only thing you've got is your rifle and your ammunition. So we would, uh, when we came back, we had nothing. Uh, we had basically the clothes on our back and a couple extra sets of, of what we called utilities or they called dungarees. We, that's, that's all we had. What was it like stepping off that plane? Uh, it was like heaven. It was like heaven. We was back in, in El Toro, California and uh, went to Pen Camp Pendleton for processing and we was pretty much let go uh, pretty quick. What was the first thing you did? First thing I did was I went to the PX and bought me a brand new shirt and a brand new pair of pants. Brand new, brand new civilian shirt and civilian pair of pants. And uh, to or go back trousers. To, to go back to the <laughs> chow issue, uh, what was your first meal back here? Uh, Steak, real steak, real potatoes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, what, what did your family, uh, were they excited that you were home? Uh, yes, absolutely they were. And yeah. you, you called them and said, hey, I'm coming home? Uh, I, I called, yeah, I called, uh, I called uh, my sister, my half-sister, uh, and told her. I didn't tell my mother and them I was coming home. Uh, I, I told my sister I'd surprise my mother, so. And did you? Oh yeah, oh yeah. What was yeah. that like? Uh, it was it was a nice reunion. It was it was. They were thankful I was home. But you still are a Marine, and you, I assume you, you went back to Camp Lejeune to become a, a uh, instructor. Yes, after after my uh, uh, leave, I had uh, I had thirty days leave, and uh, once I used that up, I went back to I had my orders delivered to me and my duty station was, uh, was uh, back to Camp Gagger at uh, North Carolina where I was t t to uh, going back as an instructor rather than a, than a troop. Let's talk about that, being an instructor. Um, what were your duties there, aside from the obvious? Well, when, when I first went there, I was a Lance Corporal uh, and my father took sick uh, like two weeks after I got back to base and uh, I took an emergency leave and I came home for another 10 days and during that period he died, uh, my stepfather, and uh, I went back. And uh, when I went back then, uh, my duties basically as a Lance Corporal was uh, running the motor pools, dispatching, things like that. And then it wasn't uh, but, a, but a just, a, just a few weeks until I uh, made Corporal. And when I made Corporal then I was, I was, we were, I was teaching during the day and then at night I was, I had my own squad of recruits, well, of, of young Marines I should say, that uh, it was our job to discipline them at night, keep them together as a unit and make sure that they didn't get wild, didn't get, uh, you know, uh, because boot camp had shortened up, the, uh, the way of training had, they had compressed everything to get it down from, from 12 weeks to six weeks, or to eight weeks. So when they came to us, it wasn't, they weren't as, as well prepared as we were when we went to our instructors. So that made it a little more difficult. You had a lot more ruffians at that time. They were putting, because of the war and the need for, the need for uh, uh, people, uh, they were putting just about anybody. At that time, the draft actually was drafting uh, Marines. Uh, they would, uh, when you went to uh, uh, take your physical, they would, uh, 
they wouldn't pick you out by size or character or anything. They would just go down the line and the recruiter would say, you, 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 because this happened to two of my nephews. And they would just pick them out and say, you're in the Marine Corps. And regardless of, the, no other way to pick them out. There was, no, there was no big tests like they have nowadays or anything. Now when you're training these uh, young men, do they, they pretty much know they're going to Vietnam? Oh yeah, they know that's where they're going. And yeah. so obviously when you mention your service there, the, do they perk up and listen? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <coughs> so yeah, they were very good about that. So how long did you do that? Oh, I did that for about uh, five months, probably six months. And uh, then uh, uh, my uh, mother was having a lot of problems and she still had two small children at home and she was ill. And so uh, I took a, uh, an early release and went to what they call the active reserves where I could be in the reserves out of Pennsylvania and I could be at home to help her. You, did you ever give any serious thought about making the military a career? Oh yes, I wanted to. That was my idea when I went in. But the family? Family came first. Correct. Um, do you still, um, are you involved in any veterans associations? Oh yes, yes. I'm a, Let's talk about that. Well, I'm a member of the American Legion Post 1288 in Bolingbrook. Uh, I'm also the commander of uh, v uh, VFW Post 5917 in Bolingbrook, uh, Illinois. Uh, very, in, very involved with Veterans Affairs. Uh, my, uh, my main goal is, uh, uh, Jay, is to see that veterans that are coming back from our campaigns overseas now don't get the treatment that the Vietnam soldiers got when they came back. Uh, the Vietnam service people when they came back were treated horribly in this country. I myself personally as well. And uh, Anything you would like to speak to? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. I, th I think it's called kind of water under the bridge now and most of the most of the people don't, uh, you know, we were we were spit at in, in, in the uh, airport so I'm I was spit at in LA uh, just because I had civilian clothes and a sea bag and muddy combat boots because I didn't have a place to put my combat boots. I had to carry them. Uh, you know, people just say things they would say. I mean, just, just tore you up. I mean, just tore you up. Made you feel like, why did I even come back to this country? Why do you think uh, the veterans are treated differently now than in that era? Well, I think we're better educated. I think people are better educated. There's not. Uh, there, there are several different reasons. I think it, I think the veterans make a big play a big part in this uh, because we've strived to make sure that the general public understands that it's not the military that the military fights the wars, but it's not the military that makes the wars. We're just uh, we're just people doing a job, just like anybody else. Uh, you, the only difference between our job and the civilian job is you can't quit. You, you, you. When you sign your name on the dotted line and you say, "I'm Uncle Sam's," I belong to. I, you're a part of the government, and you can't just up and quit. It's not allowed. It's against the law. Uh, you're, 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 you basically give up your rights. Where the average citizen, when you, if you don't like your job, you just tell them, oh, "I quit," and I'll go get another job. Well, you can't do that in the military, because you've signed those rights away. These associations uh, that you're affiliated with and commander of. Uh, aside from the veterans work, what else do you, you do charitable things for the community also? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let's talk about that a little bit. Well, when I came, uh, when I came to uh, the Chicago area in, uh, uh, and bought my first home in Bolingbrook in 1972, uh, I became involved right away with the local government uh, in a, in a uh, charitable way. Uh, both my, my wife, I'd gotten married and my, my wife and I both uh, joined the uh, what was called the civil defense then uh, because I felt that was a way to help. I'd just gotten my discharge in 1970 and uh, decided that uh, you know I needed to do something to uh, to help the community as best I could and to try to uh, to educate the community too so uh, I joined the civil defense which became uh, in Illinois became ASDA and then went nationwide emergency services and disaster agency. Uh, 
became very active in it, worked my way all the way up to director um, in the next 15 years. Uh, was director until 1993 when I stepped down. Uh, your wife and you, mm -hmm. any children? Three children. Um, my wife had three children from a previous marriage when we got married in uh, 1969, and uh, I raised those. Uh, and we had one child a couple years later, 1971. Um, any of them serve in the military? Yep. Uh, my second son uh, served uh, uh, 22 years in the Navy, just retired in 2002. What did he do in the Navy? He was uh, food service. Okay. He was food service his whole career there. That's what he went in for, and that's uh, now he's a master chef. Uh, he actually doesn't doesn't work in that profession anymore. He loves it, but he doesn't work in it. Uh, uh, he works for a uh, prominent company that supplies the military, and uh, he's our military sales representative. Let me ask you something, Larry. <coughs> what would you say to the youth of America? What would be the benefits of joining or enlisting in the military? I, I, think, it, I think it brings a lot to the table for, for a young person. Um, I think, first of all, it gives them a chance to find out what real life is all about. Uh, and if I think one of the main, the main things they can take away from it is they get a chance to see what's in other countries. I mean, most of the college students nowadays uh, that go abroad, they go to Europe. Well, Europe is, Europe is a far, far cry from the bad places in the world. I mean, there's not very many poor places in Europe anymore unless you go to the Eastern Bloc, which these people don't go to, uh, unless you go to the, to, to the Ukraine or, or to the Baltics or somewhere. Uh, to find the real poor places, you have to go. You have to be in the Peace Corps. You have to be uh, in, in uh, volunteer service uh, with the different organizations that go to Africa or Southeast Asia or the poor parts of Asia. Uh, our, our college students don't go there. This is not where they go. Uh, and, uh, where they go is to France and to Spain and to Italy. And these countries are far cry from, from having the problems that that these other countries have. I think one of the great things in the military is you'll go to those countries. You'll actually see what it's like uh, to see poor people, to see people that, that uh, don't have enough to eat, don't have any place to live, don't have any place to uh, uh, survive like we do. Uh, when I went to Vietnam the first time, my biggest uh, uh, amazement was that there were, for, for a civilization that had thrived for thousands of years, they were, while they were civilized, they weren't civilized. Uh, their, their bathroom facilities, for example, they had none. Uh, they had a common area where they, where they defecated and everything. Uh, it was a common area they did that, and it wasn't, wasn't a hidden area. They just went and did it like an animal. Uh, Things like that, it was really amazing to me because even in my poor upbringing, uh, we didn't have that. We had better than that. So it gives you a greater uh, appreciation for? Oh, absolutely, for this country and for what this country stands for, what it has accomplished in, 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 in just a little over 200 years. Uh, it gives you a great sense of, of being. And I think that one thing that people brought back to this country from over there, if nothing else, uh, we brought back a sense of what, what we really had and how to appreciate it. And the good people, uh, like myself, I, I, I go into schools every, every chance I get right now and I speak to students and I try to impress upon them, you know, the, how much difference it is with diverse communities around the world that don't really have what we have and the ways that they have to, they have to keep this in mind from a young age until they grow up so that they can be the ones to do something about it. Well, Larry, welcome home. Thank and you, sir. And your country appreciates your service. We Thank appreciate you, it very much. I appreciate being here. Thank you very much. This has been Jay Vermetti for the Veterans History Project for the Library of Congress in conjunction with the Plainfield Public Library. I've been pleased to be here with Larry Shaver, a Vietnam veteran from Bolingbrook, Illinois. Thank you very much, Larry. Thank you, Jay.